If you guys will turn with me to Revelation chapter 9, we'll be covering verses 13 through 21. Let's get some amplification, even though we don't need it, but I think it's better for this microphone here, so we're going to use it. Here we go. All right. Let's pray, you guys. Heavenly Father, we thank you for being God. We thank you for your faithfulness. I thank you for the few faithful, Lord. Thank you so much for them. It encourages me in these times like this. Ah, I thank you, Lord, that you have allowed us to just be able to gather to love you and to worship you. I thank you, Lord, that you've given us your word to know you by and to study, to just draw closer to you. We pray as we get into Revelation tonight, Lord, that you would be our teacher. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and remove me of the way, Lord, and would you just do a work here this evening? We pray for Margaret. We lift her up and ask that you'd help her to feel better, help her to heal whatever's going on with her right now, Lord, just help her to heal. We also pray, Lord, that you would bring in some worship leaders, so anybody that would just be able to help bear the burden here, Lord. These doors are open, Lord, and we ask that you'd bring people in. We just love you so much, Dad, and we just thank you for being our God. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> so, Revelation chapter 9, verse 13 through 21. If you guys remember the ending of chapter 8, we saw the first four trumpets blown. And at the end of the tail end of the chapter, there's this eagle flying in the midst of the air saying, whoa, 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 for three more trumpets are to be blown. And I'm paraphrasing, but it says something along the nature of that. Last week, we saw the first woe of that trumpet, trumpet number five. And we saw that God cast, or the, he saw the star falling out of heaven. We looked at several passages, and we saw how it's very possible that that was the moment when Bible, the Bible talks about Satan being cast out, him being thrown out of the presence of God permanently as far as the rest of history and eternity goes. And we saw last week that Satan still has access. I think somebody was telling me that you were shocked that Satan still has access to the throne room of God. Yeah. When I asked, nobody raised their hand. Yeah. <laughs> I just asked, did anybody? And actually, it was more than just you. There was a few people who was like, I didn't know that. I was like, why didn't you raise your hand? I would have expounded on that more. But interesting, did you look it up? Job 1, look it up. It's interesting. But the time is coming, and we believe last week we saw that when Satan's cast down. And we talked about when we went through our first interlude in chapter 7, how Revelation isn't necessarily in chronological order. Well, after chapter 9, we're going to take another big interlude. And we are going to cover quite a few chapters, I believe it is, before we finish the seventh trumpet. And we're going to get to chapters like 11 or 10, 11 and 12. And in there, we're going to see more specifically where Satan is cast down or he's cast out. And we believe that passage fits along the lines of with what we saw last week. And again, we'll get into that more in depth when we get there. We're not there, so we're not going to worry too much about it. Those of you guys online, thank you guys for watching. We love you too. Um, but we saw last week he was cast down and the key was given to him, the personal pronoun. And that key was the key to the bottomless pit, to Taurus. We went over that. We talked about how in the Greek culture, to Taurus was their envision of hell. Uh, if we didn't, I meant to. I studied that anyway. And how the Hebrews saw Gehenna as the embodiment of hell. But it's the same, it's the same place, the same concept. To Taurus wasn't necessarily hell, but it was as close as hell gets as far as right now is concerned. And in that time, this bottomless pit is open and these demons come out. And we saw that these demons that come out were these demons that were locked away for committing acts, um, let's just say grotesque acts. They were doing things that angels ought not to have done. They abandoned the natural function of what they were and what to be doing, and they cohabited with women, producing offspring. We call them the Nephilim, the Anakim, the giants, the warriors of old. We covered a number of passages that talked about that. And that's what the Bible says, so I, you know, I prefer not to argue with the Bible. I know there's always those that, you know want to contend and reject even amongst the Christian faith, but the Bible says it, so I'd rather just go with what the Bible says. And we saw that when these demons came out, I mean, they were just ferocious beings, and they did quite a slaughterhouse on humanity. 
And it was a trumpet worth giving woe to. I mean, it's all woe. From this first seal to the end of it, it's all a bunch of woe. But when the angel says these are some real woes, what that means is these are uniquely devastating. They're all devastating. These are just, you know, a broken toe is bad. A broken foot's worse. A broken leg is worse than all three. Well, maybe I don't know which one hurts more, but I mean, you know, you can walk on a broken toe. You can work with the broken foot. You can't do much with the broken leg. I mean, you get pretty much immobile. I mean, you break your foot, you're probably immobile too. That'd be really hard to walk with. Somebody's here. Hey, Trish, how you doing? Hey, Trish. No, you're good. And so, uh, so we, we saw that it's one of those woes. Today we get into that second woe, which is the sixth trumpet. Now today's going to be interesting. We're gonna we're gonna cover some odd portions of text, and I'm going to do my best to explain them, and we're going to see how this works out, because I, I don't know. I've done, to the best of my ability, studying this to give you guys some good meat and potatoes. That's the best way to put that, to give you guys some good food. And so, in verse 13, this is the sixth trumpet. It says, then the sixth angel sounded, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> Then the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God. One saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. So that is an odd passage of text. That is just odd. And if you just read it at face value, it's really hard to get a good grasp at what's being said. So the first thing we see is this voice from the four horns of the golden altar. These four horns are, this is that altar that we saw previously. It was in chapter eight, verse three, the golden altar that's before the throne of God. If you guys remember, we did a small visualization, at least me speaking of a visualization of what the temple was like. You remember, you walked in to the first curtain and to the left, you have the emanating lampstand, the menorah with the seven branches and the artwork and had, is the candelabra that illuminated the little place called the holy, the holy place. And then off to the right was the table of showbread where weekly that the, the bread would be replaced and the 12 breads representing the 12 tribes of Israel, one bread for each tribe. And then you walk forward more so and you come to this golden altar and it has these four horns on the four corners of this altar, and it's called the altar of incense. And it's right before this massive veil. And you'd put your incense on this altar daily, and the smoke would go up, and it represented the prayers of the Israelites or of the Jews. And for the Christian, this altar we saw in heaven, or as we saw in chapter 8, represented the prayers of God's people. That would include us. It said all the people, Jews and Christians alike, and for those who are Bible-believing you know, messianic, whatever, the, the real believer, their prayers go up on this so-called altar. Well, that's this altar. Again, it says, Then the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which are before God. Now, it says that the voice came from the horns of the altar. I don't know why it says that. I tried to find anything, and I could find nothing. What it does say, though, is that one voice spoke. So it said that a voice came from the four horns of the golden altar. Now in the Greek, when it says a voice, it more appropriately in the Greek says, I heard one voice coming out from the four horns of the altar. What's up? Oh, what verse are we in? We're in chapter uh, 9, verse 13. Oh, sorry. No, no, you're okay. Don't ever be afraid to ask. You know, and so... One voice literally is what the Greek says. So rather than hearing the multitude of voices like we heard in chapter 8, verse 3, remember all the voices of the saints are going up before God. And we saw that those particular voices that were coming up in Revelation were the voices of those who were being martyred or had been martyred. And the cry was, how long, Lord? How long until you avenge our blood on these people that have done this to us? Well, now we don't hear a multitude of voices. We hear one voice. And it's just an interesting thing that the one voice is coming out. Now, as we saw in earlier chapters, do you remember who stands in the midst of the four, you know, the four angels that surround the presence of God? And remember who's there? The Lamb. Jesus. It's Jesus, the Lamb in particular, and he's called. He saw a lamb as if slain. Now, there are those who speculate this is the voice of Jesus 
crying this out, saying, giving the judgment, which I like that. I think that makes sense because keep in mind, it's the lamb who's redeeming the world. As we saw in earlier chapters, as he breaks these seals open on this document, we, we know that to be a title deed. We went over a number of verses that validate that this is a title deed and it was a common thing in the ancient culture to redeem something in this manner. You gonna ask a question? Oh, it's just saying you said the voice was Jesus, right? It doesn't say that. It just says one voice came out. But the voice that comes out, well, let's see what it says. Verse 14, of one saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. So this voice is pronouncing the judgment. And it's appropriate that Jesus would be the one to give that pronunciation because he's the one doing the redeeming. He is the God. He is the one that has the authority to do such a thing. And so that's why I say we keep in mind that Jesus is the one redeeming the world. He's the one redeeming the title back from the enemy that was lost because of our disobedience. What I love about this is he's the one that's in control. It's, it's one of those good places to stop and remind ourselves the Lord is in control. It's easy to look at everything going on, the situations, the scenarios, the virus. And it's easy to get caught up in the moments and forget that the Lord is in control. And everything that happens passes through His hands first. Even the things that stink. We've all had bad things happen. But realize, even those bad things were allowed to pass through His hands first. I saw something today that said, when Satan reminds you of the past, Remind him of his future. I liked that until I really thought about it. Don't remind Satan of anything. When Satan reminds you of your past, praise your daddy. Because Satan doesn't have much of a future. Right. You know, don't talk to Satan ever. But I, li I used to like that a lot. And then I was studying one day and I was like, why do we talk to Satan? I ain't gonna remind him, I ain't gonna talk to that fool. <laughs> I mean, when he comes trying to whisper in my ear, I'm gonna ignore him. I'm gonna look to our father and say, Dad, get him away. But I like that. I, I get the point. Yeah, just me being a biblical butthead. <laughs> you know. But it's important for us to remember, though, that the Lord is the one who's in control. The Lord is the one who speaks from the midst and gives the commands. The Lord is the one who has the authority and the power to do what is being done. So this whole COVID thing, it's not a shock to God. It's not like God was caught off guard. Like, oh man, the Delta variant. <laughs> you know, like, you know, God is so far ahead of the game, guys, that this stuff was talked about in the Bible long, long before, you know, any of us were ever twinkles in our parents' eyes. <laughs> it's what it is. I said it. It's what it is. Well, I thought about something else, but, you know. <laughs> Don't think about continue. it. Continue. Don't think about that. Not on, not on this. But... But the point is, he's in control. And it's always good when we come to a place like this just to stop and to remind ourselves. You know, when people are reading through the book of Revelation or when I hear people talk about it, they're so fascinated with the destruction and the, everything's dying and the judgments and the hail and the demons and the Antichrist. And they're so excited with all this. And, you know, they forget to stop and remember, this is Jesus People often think in popular, popular belief amongst Christians believes that this time is the time of the devil. You guys ever watched the Left Behind series, the old school ones? Those are actually, I like them. They're pretty good. It's better than the one with Nicolas Cage for sure. You know, the music's pretty corny, but it's, it's, I think it was put, to, put together quite well. But there's that part when Nikolai in the first one is in the airplane and he gets mad and says, it's my time, it's my time. And he shakes his fist at the heavens. No, it's not his time. The Bible will say his time is short, but it's not that it's, it's his time to rule. It's just he's going to be put away in a moment is what, is what that means when we get there. It's like in chapter 12. But this is not the enemy's time. This is not the time of the devil. And we get so caught up looking at all the destruction, and it's fascinating stuff, that we forget that it's the Lord who is allowing these things. It's, these are his judgments. These demons aren't coming up because they're almighty and powerful. They're coming up because they were released. Because God released them. No other reason. God released them. He let them go. He said, all right, you bunch of turkeys, you're, here's, you're off the chain for a moment. Apart from him letting go of that chain, they're still stuck in Tartarus. Today we're going to see these four angels bound. They're bound. They're not free. And they're not unbound until God unbinds them. 
And so again, amidst popular belief of this tribulation period being the devil's time, it's just wrong. What's happening is permitted by God. These angels, these demons are only doing what they're permitted to by God. When it says here in verse 14, one saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. I think it's good to notice that these four angels are bound, as I just said a moment ago. That would give good indication that these are bad guys. These, these are, you know, it's calls them angels. These are demons. And we often forget the difference between an angel and a demon. Do you, does anybody know the difference between an angel and a demon? One is fallen and one is not. That is it. There's no other distinction. And so when the Bible calls them angels, it's not some like barbaric thought like, oh no, God, no, these are good angels that, are, that God has bound at the great river Euphrates and they're going to go and attack them. No, good angels are never bound in scripture. We never see that. Angels are free beings. They're beings of volition. They get to, I mean, I don't know where it stands now, but at one point they were able to make choice because the third of the angels rebelled against God and fell. Certain angels did certain things that caused them to be bound. I mean, we saw them last week, those in Tatars. We went over the text in Luke, or was it Matthew? It was in one of the Gospels. Remember when Jesus comes to Legion and he's going to cast them out? And they're like, no, don't take us to Tartarus or the bottomless pit. It's not our time yet. Please cast us into the pits. They, they asked for permission. It was, it, was Luke we met, it was in Luke that we met. I think it's also in Matthew. For sure it's in Luke then. But they asked to be cast into the pigs instead of down to this bottomless pit because it's somewhere where they don't want to be. They don't want to go because it's a bad place. It's a place where they are being probably tormented, I would assume. And they're, they're going through technical judgments. But good angels are never bound. The bad guys are the ones that are bound. So these are demons. But the Bible calls them angels. That's what a demon is. A demon is an angel. As I said last week, if I were to stand, okay, if I were to pull two people that none of us have ever seen, ever, and we pulled them up and we stood them up here. Hey, how are you doing? It's in Matthew 8, 28. Matthew 8, 20. I knew it was in Matthew. It might even be in Mark. But I don't think it's in John, though. But So if I were to stand two people up here that none of us have ever seen, I just knew them. One of them was a straight heathen, somebody who just doesn't believe in God, all about the pleasure of life and himself. And another one who was a Christian, I asked them to wear the same thing, get the same haircut, say nothing, just stand there. And if I asked you guys, tell me which one is the Christian and which one is not, you guys would have no way of distinguishing what's what and who's who. It'd be, it'd be impossible. You'd never, you'd never be able to tell just looking at them. Because the difference between a believer and an unbeliever is one is unborn and the other one is born again. But you can't tell otherwise. I mean, if they start talking, you can start putting stuff together. But even then, sometimes it's really hard to distinguish because some unbelievers play the part quite well. They start, start sounding kind of like a Christian. They start saying things that are like, well, maybe this guy, you know, they say any little thing dealing with God and we start thinking, maybe they're a Christian. And then the one who's a believer simply produces fruit. Unless it's very squeaky, huh? <laughs> yes. but, but my point is, is there'd be no way of distinguishing them apart from that. Angels are no different. There's no way to tell an angel a good one from a bad one, but Hollywood says that they're mean and scary and dark. And have you ever noticed how Judas was painted and all the paintings? Every time you see a, a classic painting of Judas from the antiquity era, do you know how he looks always, almost always? Ominous. He's always, always like a, a shadowy kind of figure. He's darker than the rest. He's always like got some kind of sneaky look on his face. He uh, always, you can always spot Judas from all the other guys. It's easy. But the truth was, when they were at the Last Supper and Jesus said, when you'll betray me, yeah. nobody said, Judas, what are you doing? They, wanted to know who it was. they said, is it me? Nobody, nobody did Judas. Even after he said, it's the one I dip with, and then he hands it to Judas, they just wondered, well, he's dipping with all of us. Well, and Judas goes off them. They just assumed he was going to buy more stuff. Because he's, he's the good guy, right? He carries the money. They, didn't, they weren't able to distinguish. 
It's no different with, with the angels. So here it says that these angels are bound at the great river Euphrates. These are demons. Demons and angels look the same. and are no different. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 12 or 11, don't be shocked, 10, 11, or 12. 12 is the visions, but I still think it's 12. But nonetheless, Paul says this in 2 Corinthians, that don't be surprised when Satan shows up as an angel of light. Him and his ministers, because they're angels. When we get to our Genesis study, that's one of my favorite teachings. In Genesis 3, when you listen to that one, huh? when, when Satan shows up, because what we've been taught about Satan by and far is a lie. When you look at the actual Hebrew behind it, when you look at what's actually being taught, it makes so much more sense that when Lucifer showed up in the garden, he showed up as a gleaming, dazzling, glorious angel. There's no way you'll ever convince me that God's crowning creation was stooped by a snake or a serpent of any kind. Man is God's crowning creation, made in his own image. Adam was by and far a genius. Adam wasn't created as some being who was just this moron who had to learn everything along the way. Adam was created with intelligence. Do you know why we call a giraffe a giraffe? Because Adam called it a giraffe. Do you know why we call monkeys monkeys? Because Adam called it a monkey. Do you know why we call woman woman? Because Adam looked at woman and said, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, I'll call her woman. Adam was by no means a stupid man. Adam fellowshiped with God on a way that we never have. So you're, you'll, you'll never convince me that Adam was duped by a talking snake or some kind of lizard, or who Adam was duped by, what scripture tells us, was the, one of the most glorious angels ever created. And when he showed up in his glory, and when we get to Genesis 3 one of these days, you'll see why I say that, because of the Hebrew. It would make sense that when Adam sees this being, glorified just in all his glory shining bright and he's telling him what God said I think that makes sense how you get duped I just want to clarify the difference between the angels and the demons there is no difference one is fallen one is not it's it it's how we have Mormonism <laughs> you, Joseph Smith according to the Mormonism a, the angel Gabriel showed up to him and gave him a new revelation you know, I, I wouldn't be shocked if he actually had an encounter with an angel. I would not be shocked. That would actually be quite clever of the enemy. But Paul says, even if an angel shows up and gives you another gospel, uh-uh. Well, the Mormons were given another gospel. So, uh-uh. So when again, we're in chapter 9 of Revelation, verse 13 through 21. So again, in verse 14, of one saying to the sixth angel, this is Jesus speaking who had the trumpet, he says, of one saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. Now, the river Euphrates, oh, I want to say something, I wrote this down. For the reason that these particular angels are bound, we don't know. They may have been part of the angels that cohabited with women. For sure, the ones we talked about last week were. We saw that in Jude, we saw that in Peter, we saw the references in Genesis. Those ones we know were the ones that cohabited with women. These ones, it's not, we're not told why they're bound. These guys are some heavy leaders though. And so why they're bound, we don't know, but they're being bound by God. But now he talks about, at the end of verse 14, they're bound at the great river Euphrates. Now the Euphrates River is an important river. It's one of the longest rivers in the world. It's the most important river in the Middle East. And it's mentioned from the beginning to the end of the book, of the whole Bible. Its first mention is in Genesis 2.14. It's mentioned throughout the Bible. As a matter of fact, the river Euphrates, that is the actual borderline of Israel. When God tells them the land that they're going to take, he talks about it's going to be from the Nile, the Great Sea, all the way to the river Euphrates. And those will be their more. So Israel, the, the land that they've occupied has never been more than 10% of what God promised them. Now the Euphrates River, the last time it's mentioned is Revelation 16, 12. But it's an interesting river. When we look at the book of Daniel, the four main secular nations that are mentioned are the Assyrian Empire, 
the Babylonian Empire, the Medo-Persian Empire, and the Roman Empire. These four empires all had a place at the Euphrates River during their reign. All of them. Well, why? Because they ruled in that whole Middle Eastern area, and the River Euphrates is an important river. I say that for, for a certain reason, and we're going to actually make a turn. We're going to make a turn to Daniel chapter 10. Now, if you guys were with us when we talked through the book of Daniel, this would definitely make a lot more sense. I don't have the time to quite cover it like I did when we talked through Daniel. But there are some things that are mentioned concerning world powers. We meant Daniel chapter 10. We're going to look at verse 13. But if you guys remember, well, what was it? Let me think here. Um, I talked about it. I had it in my head before I said that. And just pew, shut up. I don't know. But if you guys remember when we went through Daniel, we saw that world leaders and demons, I don't want to say coexist, there's powers behind the world leaders. Let's just put it like that. Look at what Gabriel says, speaking here in chapter 10, verse 13. Remember, Daniel is fasting. He's praying. He wants to know what these meanings are that God is showing him. We saw chapter 9. God gave him this crazy vision. And Daniel saw everything from beginning to end. He saw the Messiah coming. He saw the Antichrist coming. Cut off the seven-year period of tribulation, this 70th week of Daniel. He saw all this stuff. And he's fasting. He prays because he wants to understand and know more. Well, Gabriel answers the prayer, and he's off to come give Daniel the revelation, to give him the interpretation, to explain to him what this stuff means. Do you guys remember what happens to Gabriel? He gets stopped. Verse 13, he tells us, But the prince of the kingdom of Persia was withstanding me for 21 days. The prince of the king of Persia. Last week, remember, we talked about the prince of Tyre? and the king of Babylon, or the king of Tyre and the king of Babylon, and how we talked about how there's the physical nation. But in both of those instances, in, in Ezekiel and in Isaiah, how as he, God is prophesying, talking to these kings, a shift takes place, and all of a sudden, God is talking to Satan. Remember Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28? You guys remember that or no? Well, if you don't, go back and watch it from last week. But we see a shift take place. Remember when he's talking to the king of Tyre, he starts talking about how you were in the Garden of Eden. Well, the king of Tyre wasn't in the Garden of Eden. Actually, the only two humans that were ever in the Garden of Eden were Adam and Eve. He starts talking about how he is the most beautiful of creation, that every precious stone was in him, that he was one of God's favorite. And that he starts talking about all this stuff, and he starts saying things that apply to Satan. How can that be if he's talking to the king of Tyre? And so we talked about last week how God often looks through the physical into the spiritual. We talked about, you know, Ephesians 6, how it's not just flesh and blood, but it's against the spiritual, the, the, the powers, the rulers of the air, and so forth. And we talked about there's entities behind all things taking place. And we believe that over every nation, over every superpower, over every king, that there is a spiritual entity, so to speak, assigned. Well, here he says that the prince of the kingdom of Persia was withstanding him. Now, if it was just a physical prince, explain to me how he would withstand the angel Gabriel, the one who stands in the presence of God. That'd be Let's put it like this. When Elisha was camping out with his little servant boy and they got surrounded by the Assyrians and the servant boy's freaking out, Elisha prays and says, Lord, open his eyes so he can see what I see. And he sees all these fiery chariots all around him. And it says they go to bed sleeping in peace. And it says one angel came that night and wiped out 185,000 men of the Assyrian army. One angel just decimates them. So one prince of a kingdom will do nothing to an angel. Unless this prince we mentioned here is also an angel. Look what he says as we go forward. He says, The prince of the kingdom of Persia was withstanding me for 21 days. Then behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I had been left there with the kings of Persia. He says, Now I have come to give you an understanding of what will happen to you, your people, in the latter days, for the vision pertains to the days yet future. And then he goes even deeper. He talks about the kingdom of, ba kingdom of Assyria, the kingdom of Babylon, the kingdom of the Medo Persians, and of the Romans. And we went over that in depth when we went through Daniel. Mm -hmm. We took our time and we just, we really went through that. So I'm not going to do that now. But my point is, we see that these four main nations that Daniel deals with are 
the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Medo-Persians, and the Roman Empire. I find it interesting that we see four angels bound at the great river Euphrates. Now, I'm not saying that these four angels are those four angels that were of those nations, but I'm not saying that they're not either. One thing is for sure, they were powerful angels. How do I know? Because it took Michael the archangel to come and free up Gabriel so he can get to Daniel. So whatever this, this angel of Persia is, was a big wig. Again, these are four of the greatest nations that have ever existed. So I'm gonna imagine that these, it's not Satan, we know it's not Satan for sure, but whatever these four angels are that were over them, it appears this could be them. I'm not saying it is, but it would make sense if it were so. But we see them here bound, let's go back to the book of Revelation, we see them bound at the great river Euphrates. In verse 15 it says, And the four who are bound at the great river Euphrates, or, and the four angels who had been prepared for the day and the month and year were released so that they would kill a third of mankind. Now did you, did you notice what happened to them? They were released. Again, I want to circle back. You weren't here when I said this, but their releasing is nothing short of Jesus letting go. They're not free to do what they want. They're not free to just be these mighty, powerful beings. They are free to do what God allows them to do only. It says that they were prepared. They've been held back for this day, this hour, this month, this. I mean, for this specific time. Now God is allowing them to go free as he's pouring his judgment out on a world that has rejected him, in essence. Right. So... Yeah, I mean, basically. But one of the craziest things about this passage here, and we're going to touch on this as we go further on down, is the end of verse 15. It says that when they, they were released so that they would kill a third of mankind. Now we're going to see just how devastating a third of mankind being killed is. Because as devastating as a third of mankind being wiped out today would be, this is so much more intense than what you have in mind. And you'll see why when we get there. But let's go to verse 16. He says, The number of the armies of the horsemen was 200 million. I heard the number of them. So as these angels are released, the number of their armies are 200 million. Now, in the 1970s, China bragged that they could assim assimilate an army of 200 million men. And there have been those who look at that and say, Ah, these are the armies of China. And I doubt it. You know, Maybe, maybe they are. I, it doesn't tell us. We do know that the number is 200 million. Now, we're not told if this army of 200 million is a physical army of men, a spiritual army of demons, or both. We do know that there are spiritual entities behind all things taking place. You know, we talk about that. But we also talk about how we don't want to just ascribe everything to the devil. Behind every salt shaker, behind every remote control, behind every, you know. But the truth is, behind everything where morality exists is spiritual entities at work. Good and bad. You know, the cartoons often portray the little angel and the devil on the shoulder. And, you know, they're fighting for the conscience of the person. I mean, that is a real thing. We deal with that. That's called spiritual warfare. There is a fight for your soul. There is a fight for my soul. And the enemy will do anything to win it over. Now, if you've come to Christ, he can't win it over. But he'll do whatever he can or he'll allow his minions to do whatever he can to make your life a living hell so that you are as ineffective as possible for the kingdom. So again, we're not told whether this 200 million man army, it doesn't say man, it just says the army of the horsemen was 200 million. It doesn't say it's 200 million men. It doesn't say anything of that nature. So it may be physical men assembled. It may be spiritual demons assembled. Or it simply may be a mixture of the two. I mean, either way, it doesn't matter. But I like how John says here at the end of verse 16, I heard the number of them. As if to say I didn't accidentally say that number. I said what I said and I meant what I said. 200 million wasn't even a conceivable number at the time that this was written. I mean, the biggest number really possible in the mind of the ancient was 10,000. Like you 10, never, yeah, 10, they say, that's why they say 10,000 or 10,000. Because that's, I mean, that was your way of saying that's a lot of people. Because the idea of going past 10,000 was just, you never would. 
And so when John says, I heard the number of them, that's his way of validifying, verifying. I know what I heard is this. So it says, the number of the armies of the horsemen was 200 million. I heard the number of them. Verse 17, and this is how I saw in the vision the horses and those who sat on them. The riders had breastplates of color, of the color of fire, of hyacinth, and of brimstone. And the heads of the horses are like the heads of lions, and out of their mouths proceed fire and smoke and brimstone. I'll read verse 18 also. A third of mankind was killed by these plagues, by the fire and the smoke and the brimstone which proceed out of their mouths. For the power of the horses is in their mouths and in their tails, for their tails are like serpents and have heads, and with them they do harm. So verse 18 first, he says, A third of mankind was killed by these three plagues. Or verse 17, I'm sorry. And this is how I saw in the vision the horses of those who sat on them. The riders had breastplates, the color of fire, of uh, hyacinth, and of brimstone. And the heads of the horses are like the heads of lions. And out of their mouths proceed fire, smoke, and brimstone. So first, John gives us a description of these, what he's seeing, these demons, these whatever, whatever he's seeing, he's giving us descriptions of them. We saw last week when John gave descriptions that the descriptions, we don't want to take so much as literal we always take the Bible literal, but we want to take the time to notice when it's using hyperbole, when it's using met, uh, metaphors, when it's using anything that's not being literal, but there's a literal meaning behind it. We know what we're talking about, right? Like, you know, if I were to say you're as skinny as a stick, nobody would actually think you're as skinny as a stick. It just means you're a really skinny person. If I were to say you're as fat as a hippo, nobody would think you're as fat as a hippo. It's impossible. A human can't be that. What do you mean, Walter? It means that you're abnormally large. If I were to say, man, your hair looks slick, or, you, or you know, oh, you look hot, it doesn't mean that you have a temperature of 104, it just, you, know, you look really nice. Or, figure of speech. Yeah, figure of speech is exactly what it is. And so we want to know when the Bible is using figure of speech, hyperbole, a metaphor, anything of that nature. Because the Bible uses a lot of it. They're actually, in the ancient mindset, that's how they talked a lot. Which shouldn't be shocking because that's how we talk too. We are no different. We just use different figures of speech. We say things like cool. Do you know what cool actually means? Cold. That's what cool means. Cool doesn't mean I like it. Cool means cold. Or that's fire. What that means is something's on fire. Or pump your brakes. That doesn't mean calm down. That means actually step on your brakes wherever they're at in your car, you know. Or on your bicycle. Or, you know, we use figures of speech also. So it's not far-fetched to believe that the Bible uses figure of speech also. So you get those Christians who are these little, you know, they're these little atom bombs that go around and, you know, everything's got to be exactly literal or it's completely hyperbole. You know, it's hard to find Christians that are just simply in the middle. I'm here to tell you, just about everything entailing the Word of God and with God has a center. Everything is centered. Your DNA is centered. Was it last week we talked about what happened? Was it, I don't know if it was Thursday night or Sunday morning. On one of our services, we talked about what happens when your 21st set of chromosomes has an extra chromosome. You know what happens? when? You, so you have 23 sets of chromosomes, which makes 46 chromosomes total in your DNA, in the, in the makeup of your DNA. And when your 21st set has three instead of two, do you know what happens to you? You get something called Down syndrome. The tiniest little just... So even to a molecular level, if it's not centered and perfect, there's issue. God is centered. We talk about, especially Irene and I, we've talked about Calvinism. They're way too far right. They're so far right, they distort the gospel. They ruin the scriptures because they are not all. If you're a Calvinist, just take a chill pill, figure of speech, you know. But many of them that I've met are so far into the whole predestination and God is sovereign and rah, they get crazy. And they forget that God has given us a limited will. We have a will. We don't have perfect will. I mean, I can't just make things appear at the whim of my mind. I can't bring things into creation with just the thought of it or the word of it. I can build something on it. But I also have the free will to be able to, you know, throw this remote at Joe's head. 
I like you, so I won't do that. But I could do it if I wanted. God. <laughs> I don't want to shine her tonight. <laughs> yeah, this isn't that heavy. It'd sting more than anything. But, you know, but we have a limited will. And then you get these guys that are completely, we call them Arminianists. So we have the Calvinist. And then the, these other guys that are called Arminianists. And they just go all the way left. And they say, you know, we have nothing but will. As a matter of fact, God kind of winds up the world and sets it in motion and backs off and does nothing. And it's all on you. You can get saved and lose your salvation 15 times a day if you want. So if you've ever heard somebody say you can lose your salvation, I mean, would you really want to serve a God where your salvation is not secure? So you guys, I think most of us in here have seen The Chosen, right? I love when Mary goes off and acts a fool. It's, it's awesome. Now, the Bible doesn't say she ever did that. But I love how they incorporated that. And, you know, she comes back, oh, I'm embarrassed. Because that's really how we are, right? You mess up and it's, you know, coming back to the Lord is hard because we feel like we've let him down. We feel like, man, Lord, I've just I've lost my salvation. But I love in the show what Jesus says to Mary. He says, that doesn't sound like much of a salvation now if you could lose it overnight, does it? I love that because that's, that's the essence of the gospel. Is your salvation isn't contingent on you. It's contingent on Jesus. Your only responsibility in salvation is accepting it. That's it. That's all you can do. And you know, the Calvinists, they're so far right. That's a work. It's not a work. We can do no work pertaining to salvation. What that means is we can't accomplish the, the, the work of the law to attain salvation. We can, however, accept the work of the fulfilled law to attain salvation. That's not work. That's an acceptance. It has nothing to do with the law of salvation. So when the Bible talks about we're not saved by works, it's the works of the law. So the far, if you're too far right, whether it's Christian or political, you're wrong. And if you're too far left, you're wrong. Here, I'll give you guys one. I'm sure somebody in here will disagree with me. That's okay. Who's that one chick that backed out of the Olympics because she wasn't in her right mind? Simone? Simone, Simone. I'll just say Simone. Yeah, but I don't know. It's Simone. The girl who backed out. Simone Biles, right? She's getting blasted by the far right. Because, oh, I'm like, well, you know, okay. So I read a little bit about it. And the left is completely in defense of her. And the right's completely blasting her. And oh, how dare she? And blah, 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 blah. Well, you know, I've read into it. I've looked at it. And should she have gone to the Olympics? Probably not. You know, her mom just died. Mentally, she was enough she was enough distracted that she smoked weed prior to going so I mean obviously she wasn't fully there I know she wanted to go it's a big deal to go to the influence they let her go they looked past some stuff and she went and then she decided while she was there that she's not in her right mind so she's gonna back out right a lot of people are really mad I'm glad she backed out no, she's back in now. she's back in she got a bronze oh well, good good for her I didn't dog her when she backed out you know I'm gonna be honest with you you know I would dare any of you to stand on a chair and do a triple backflip right away. I bet you none of you will. I won't do it. You know why I won't do it? I like my neck not being broken. <laughs> you know? Now these gymnasts, they have to be extremely concentrated when they're doing something. If you were to race a vehicle, if you take your eye off, you get distracted by the smallest little bit, that's your life. When you're flying through the air doing flips, to be off by the smallest bit, it's a broken neck. It's a shattered spine. So when she backed out, I was like, well, that stinks, you know. But I'm glad she backed out. If she, you know, if she didn't feel confident, I wouldn't do that jump either. I'll be honest with you. Now, I'm sure there's somebody out there online that can't believe I just said that. You, you, you liberal. I'm not a liberal. I'm nothing. I mean, I'm so far from a liberal. I've just learned to be balanced. I don't go far right because everybody goes far right. I look at each situation and I judge it accordingly. I don't always agree with what the right does. I usually don't agree with what the left does. But I'm not going to just dismiss it because they're left. And I'm not going to just accept it because they're right. That's just stupidity. And Christianity is no different. Well, they're, uh, they're, they're super conservative. We'll accept it. They're super liberal. and we'll, That's stupidity. A Christian is to be centered. Here's the hard, cold truth. God is sovereign, man has free will. Well, I can't accept that, then you don't know the Jesus of the Bible. Because that's what the Word of God teaches. God is fully sovereign, man has free will. God knows the outcome of everything that will ever happen, yet God will never enforce you, or He'll never make you and force you to do something, ever. 
even though he knows the outcome of what you're already going to do. Centered. Don't ask how I got there. Oh, because John's descriptions, you know, the liberals getting all crazy. So last week we saw John give these descriptions. So when the Bible says something, it's not always literally what's being said. So here when John says that in verse 17, he saw the horse and in his vision, the horse and those who sat on them, the riders, they had breastplates of color. He names all these colors, the heads of lions. We saw the tail of scorpions last week and all this stuff. Well, horses in John's day represented warfare. Now, exactly whatever John saw, we don't know exactly. John is describing them as a horse. That is war. We've seen throughout Revelation, war is going to be a big part of this time. Not only God judging the world, but mankind attacking itself. Remember in the earlier verses of the seals where it says that mankind turned on each other and they slaughtered each other and that word for the slaughter was the type of slaughter used for a butcher. Remember we talked about that? So there's going to be a lot of war during this time also. So these horses more than likely represent warfare. And he says they had faces like lions. Lions are fierce, determined, stalk and slaughter. It's going to be a mess. And he said that they had these colors and out of them come fire, smoke, and brimstones. These are descriptions of horror and destruction. And this is, this is pictorial of, I mean, devastation. Tanks. Think tanks. Think, I mean, could it be? I mean, we know for sure there's demonic presence behind all this. Whether there's actual demons also attacking, we know there's going to be other things taking place. There's going to be tanks, there's going to be guns, there's going to be bombs going off. We've talked about some of these, these things that we've seen that appear to be bombs. We talked about Chernobyl. We talked about those things. Remember, you guys, that was, don't forget that stuff. So don't just think that it's all just this invisible demonic attack on mankind. Is that going to be happening? I do believe so, yes. Remember that oftentimes the spiritual seeks to use the physical in order to inhibit. That's why we see physical people being possessed. So that may be that. So again, whether this is descriptive of modern warfare or simply supernatural acts, it's not made clear, but we can assume that the both are more than likely taking place. But you never want to get so you know, set on the wall. He said they're like horses with lions and then so it's, it's that or it's nothing. Hyperbole. Figure of speech. Those things are used. Remember, John is looking into a day and age that's not even here yet. Mind you, 100 years ago, the thought of going faster than 20 miles an hour was inconceivable. You know what they said would happen if you went past 20 miles an hour? This was the idea of the science of the day. You'd be going so fast, your eyeballs would suck right out of your head. That was the science about 100 years ago, maybe a little further back. To go faster than 20, 25, don't do it. You'll die. Not anymore. I mean, I've done at least like 150 on the freeway on a motorcycle before. Yeah, my eyes are still here. You might lose your head if you wreck, but I know, I know, I know, I'm not smart, but I've done it. My, my point, my point is, you know, John is looking into a day and age that's not even here yet. And so John is doing his best to describe to us what he's being shown. Now, in verse 18, look at what it says. A third of mankind was killed by these plagues, by the fire and the smoke and the brimstone which proceed out of their mouths. No, fire, that, that, can, that can be descriptive of a lot of stuff. Is that fly bothering you guys too? Is it on me? Stupid no. fly. I got this gun at my house. It's a salt gun. Oh, I hate flies. I talk to God and I say, Lord, I kind of feel bad, but these flies are going to die. <laughs> so I kill them. I can't stand flies. You just love your gun. I do. I'm not going to lie. It's like playing video games. I, I'm not a video game fan, but it's in real life. So it's so much funner. You know? But when we look at this though, you guys, the, this fire, this brimstone, that, 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 that can easily be descriptive of, of bombs, of, of gunfire. Have you ever seen a gunfire at night? Flashes of fire flow out the barrel. I mean, we don't, we don't know what John is seeing, but he says there's fire, there's brimstone, and there's smoke. I do know that when you let a bomb off, there's fire, there's smoke, and technically there's brimstone. I mean, it's very descriptive of a bomb. Does it mean it is? It may simply be that there are these horses running around, lion's heads spitting fire and brimstone and smoke out their mouth. There could be that too. And I'm not going to you know, take God's place and say what is and isn't. But realistically, this is a type of warfare taking place. And it appears that these demons are behind what's happening. 
You're going to see what I mean here in a minute. But notice in verse 18, a third of mankind was killed by these plagues, by the fire and the smoke and the brimstone which proceeded out of their mouths. And just to note, the fire and the bullet go out of the mouth of the gun. Mm -hmm. That's how you would actually describe that. Just saying, when you're using a figure of speech of a gun being shot, the bullet comes out of its mouth. So, just saying, doesn't mean it's it. But it says a fourth, a third of mankind is wiped out. Now, in chapter six, do you remember in that first wiping out of mankind, we saw that a fourth of mankind was wiped out. You guys remember that or no? Yeah. Do you guys remember the? pictures that I gave concerning that. You two weren't here. So, I mean, I wrote some stuff down here. It's not going to be quite as in-depth, but I'm going to cover this. Today, there's roughly 8 billion people in the world. Now, when we get to this period, I don't know what it might be tomorrow and it might be in 20 years. I don't know. But we can assume there's going to be more than 8 billion people at this time. So, keep in mind, at this point, the rapture has happened. However many Christians have gone, are gone. Let's just say that 8 billion people are left. To take out a fourth of mankind from 8 billion, that's to take out 2 billion people. That's a lot of people, right? 2 billion people. I'm talking mostly to you two ladies. You two, you three have heard this. But you two ladies haven't, but you guys should still hear it anyway. Just re, re, re-hear it. 2 billion people wiped off the face of the earth. That means 6 billion people would be left. Let's put it in this type of perspective. In Asia, Asia contains... 4 billion people, 4.5 billion people. The whole country, the continent of Asia, 4.5 billion people. More than half the world's population lives in Asia. Africa contains about 1.5 billion people. Africa, the continent, Asia, the continent alone make up 6 billion people. Well, in chapter 6, it says one fourth of mankind will be wiped out. So if there were 8 billion people, that means. Asia and Africa would have survived and the rest of the world would be wiped out. No more North America, South America, Antarctica is pretty much nothing anyway. Um, you know, but you go to all Europe, nothing. That's some perspective. That's crazy, right? The entire world except these two continents would technically be wiped out just number-wise. Well, then we see a bunch of slaughter going on. Last week, those demons that were really... I mean, we've seen a lot of people die since. So we don't know how many people are left. We know that maybe there's 6 billion people from the first, fourth. But now it says another third is gone. So let's just pretend like there still was 6 billion people, right? Well, a third of that is another 2 billion. That would wipe down the population to half of what it was to begin with. 4 billion people left. That is nuts. For lack of words, that is insane. That kind of death is not, it's unprecedented. There's, I mean, there's nothing to even compare it to. The, 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 German, the camps in Germany don't even come close, not even almost on the same level. I mean, Stalin murdered 20 million of his own people, nothing. What is it, that emperor in China, I think like 60 million of his own? I mean, these numbers are minute. Just to give you perspective of how big a billion is, a billion is a hundred million ten times. Ten times. So let's say in China, 60 million, Stalin, 20 million, the Jews, another 6 million. That's roughly 86 million. You'd have to multiply that about 13 or 14 times to get 1 billion. At this point, over 4 billion are dead. There's no way to even bear I mean, you're at, the, you're at a loss at this point. I mean, the point is, this is devastating. It is just simply devastating. I mean, there's no other way to say that. I do want to mention something. In verse 18, when it says, A third of mankind was killed by these plagues, by the fire and the smoke and the brimstone which proceed out of their mouths. Verse 19, For the power of the horses is in their mouths and in their tails. For their tails are like serpents and have heads, and with them they do harm. Excuse me. This word power in the Greek is an interesting word. I don't know what compelled me to look this up, but I looked it up because I just wanted to see if it was the normal word for power that you see. Like when you go to uh, Acts chapter 1, remember Jesus says, go wait for me until the Holy Spirit comes with power. Remember that? The word power used there is the Greek word dunamis. And the word dunamis literally means it, it, it's an inherent power. It's, it's strength. It's, ah, it's might. Almost like an exploding power. Like, ah. 
You know, the ability to do incredible things with your might and power, physical strength. The Greek word here in verse 19 for the power of the horses is exousia. And what this means is this is the power of influence or authority. I found that completely interesting. I've been in so many revelation studies, I've never heard this. But exousia, E-X-O-U-S-I-A, the power of influence or authority. Now listen to what he says here. For the power of the horses is in their mouth. The power of influence, it's in their mouths. And in their tails, for their tails are like serpents and have heads. And with them they do harm. Spell it again. E-X-O-U-S-I-A. Exousia. And it's the power of influence or authority. And it says that the tails are like serpents and they have these heads. Now serpents throughout scripture are always shown as cunning and deceptive and things of that nature. It's why Satan is called a serpent. He's a deceiver. He's cunning. He's here to trick, to cause people to fall. So I find it interesting that these pictures are given to these demons. The power of the horses, this, this influential power is in their mouths. Now, do you guys remember what happens when the beast comes? We haven't seen him yet. When the beast, actually we did, we saw him in the opening chapters of 6. But we haven't seen him really on scene much here. But the beast and the false prophet, do you remember what's one of the incredible things about them is? Is they have this ability to just sweet talk. You guys remember how Obama was? Sorry if you're an Obama fan, just suck it up. <laughs> you know, but I was not a fan of Obama. I did not like his policies. I, I still don't care for him either. You know, I don't, I just didn't like Obama. I don't care that he was black or white. If he was the whitest guy you ever seen, I still wouldn't like him. I did not like what he stood for. But the one thing that I gave Obama, he was very well dressed and articulated. He stuttered a lot, but articulate. I mean, he sweet talked. He knew how to sweet talk. He did a good job. Trump couldn't sweet talk anything. He's there's nothing sweet about his talk, but I love it because he's just real. It's just you, you just what you hear is what you get. Very blunt. Obama was everything but blunt, but he told you what you wanted to hear. And I mean, I get why people liked him. I get it. I know I, I saw right through the garbage, but I get it. Sweet talk. <laughs> if they heard you. I'm not gonna, I wouldn't be shocked. <laughs> you know, but Sorry. he's given this picture as power of influence in their mouths, and their tails are like serpents and have heads, and with them they do harm. And they appear to be cunning, deceptive, and have power of influence with their speech. That appears what's being said here. So, are these world powers being spoken of? Kind of like the king of Babylon, like the king of Tyre, kind of like the king of Persia and the king of Rome or the emperor of Rome, so to speak, on the spiritual scale? Maybe. Maybe. I, I don't know. I don't pretend to have the answers. John has been given these visions or this vision and he's explaining it to the best of his ability and we're doing our best to cipher what he said with what he gave us. But I find that Shocking, And because of that word power in the Greek, I will take that stance that I believe these are world powers here. And these demons have that control. Because we kind of look at what's taking place today in our world. And those who have powers of authority have the power to control. Is that not how Hitler was able to send six million Jews to the gas chambers and fry their bodies? How Stalin was able to send 20 million of his own into starvation. And was it Chao Zhao? And whatever that Chinese emperor was who sent 60 million of his to the grave. So we see that it appears that these demons have a world platform where they're able to wage and cause war on a degree unheard of. And keep in mind, war going forward, we're looking at things like nuclear war. We talked about nukes several weeks ago, maybe even like a month ago. Remember, we talked about Chernobyl, how they still suffer from the effects of what happened in Chernobyl. If a nuclear war were to break out, I mean, the devastation from that is... We do want to remember God often uses physical means to accomplish his spiritual will. 
because the spiritual will is physical, because there's no such thing as just spiritual and physical. The truth is, spiritual and physical are 100% and 100%. Each of you is 100% spiritual and 100% physical. And the biggest disservice that people do with the Word of God is they separate the two. And they put the spiritual on one end and the physical on another, but the truth is, they both are. We are created as spiritual, physical beings. When we resurrect, we're going to resurrect in spiritual, physical bodies. We saw last, was it? last Sunday, we saw that. We've been going over the resurrection in chapter 15 of, of 1 Corinthians. We saw that those bodies are built for the spiritual realm, remember? But we also saw that the physical bodies that attain to food and touch and all that good stuff that goes with that. One of the biggest disservices we do as Christians is separate the two. Trish, you're physical, you're spiritual. You're physical, you're spiritual. All of you, we're physical and spiritual. It's why you can never just truly be physical in your doing. It's because you lack a spiritual need. It's why you guys show up on Thursday nights. Because you want to be fed the spiritual food that ah, builds your spirit. But it also builds your flesh. Your physical being, not your flesh as in the bad stuff. But you know what I mean. You walk away edified mentally and spiritually. You should. Now, when we get to verse 20 and 21, these are two of the saddest verses in all of Scripture. There's others also that are quite sad, but verse 20 says, The rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands, so as not to worship demons and the idols of gold and of silver and of brass and of stone and of wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. In the midst of God judging the world, they refuse to repent. That's the most absurd thing. Have you guys ever heard someone say, well, if God would show himself, I would repent. I would give my, if God would just show himself to me, I would give my life to him. Have you guys ever heard somebody say that? I have. Have you guys ever said that yourselves, maybe in the past, before you came to Christ? I may have, I don't know. But, that, that's, that's an, not an uncommon thing for unbelievers to say. Well, if God would reveal himself, I would, I would come. I'm going to tell you something that's just sad and true. No, you wouldn't. If God showed himself to you, you wouldn't do anything. You'd just do what you're doing. How do I know that? Because 2,000 years ago, God showed up and then proved it. And people are still debating on whether or not he's the truth, the way, or the life. I mean, his people crucified him. If God were to show up, the truth is, the people who reject him would still reject him. More than likely. I'm sure there would be some people who convert, but realistically, by and far, people would not. Because the truth is, people don't want God to show up. They want their idea of God to show up. Most people that come to church, they want their idea of the church. They want their idea of the Bible. And the second you offend their idea, what do they do? They're out the door and they'll never come back. That pastor, I can't believe he said that. Oh, oh, I can't believe it. I'm sure some people online have been offended with what I've said. And I'm like, I'm going to vlog off. I'll teach that pastor. I don't give two hoots. I can care less. I can give two hoots. <laughs> I'm not here to give you my idea of anything. I'm here to tell you what the Bible says. Well, I don't like that. Then don't listen, but I don't know what to tell you. Then leave. <laughs> you know, what, what do you want from me? I'm here to tell you the truth. Well, it's not my truth. Well, then you live a lie. Because there's only one truth, and the truth is whatever God says it is. <sighs> no amount of evidence can cause someone to repent. One repents when they choose to believe. That's it. God will give you the evidence. God will show you the works. And at that point, you just, you believe or you don't believe. Either you're looking to feel that spiritual need that we all have, or you're more interested in you. You see, the person who's willing to put themselves down is willing to accept the offer that God brings forth. That's somebody who's willing to repent. But the person who's looking for self-gratification, no amount of evidence will ever, ever, convince them that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No amount of evidence will ever convince them to repent. In this time, these people are experiencing God's hand of judgment personally, worldwide. 
I mean, the revelation records it. So they have this beforehand. And it says here that they refuse to repent. And they would rather walk in the gratification of their own hearts, for lack of better words. Realize, guys, when people reject Christ, what they're doing is they're just rejecting accountability. They're rejecting sin. They don't want, they don't want to be told that they're sinning. They don't want to be told that what I'm doing is wrong. We all just want to be viewed as God's children. We all just want to be viewed, we're all going to heaven. And the truth is, no, we're not. Unfortunate. It's unfortunate. I wish we were all going to heaven. I wish. The road is narrow. The road is narrow. But they refused to repent. Listen to verse 21. And they did not repent of their murders, nor their sorceries, nor of their immorality, nor of their thefts. They want to worship their idols their way. And either God conforms to me or I don't like that God. I'll go find my own God. Do you know when we partake in acts such as murder, sorcery, immorality, and theft, we are playing the harlot with, so to speak, other gods? You ever thought of it like that? Most of I mean, I don't usually until I'm studying and I see something like this and I'm like, oh man. Well, they're just little white lies. It's playing the harlot with another god. Well, it's just I just I just looked once. It's playing the harlot with another god. Well, I just stole something. It was, just, it was a paper clip, or I am I'm sure nobody would care. If it's a paper clip, just ask for the paper clip. They'll probably give it to you. It was just a pen. It was just ten bucks. That's, that's just a just a justification. There's no justifying playing the harlot with another god. Do you guys know what sorceries are in the Bible? Do you know what the Bible calls sorcery? Is anybody near? What is that? Say it again. Palm readers. Palm readers. Okay, no. Pharmakia is the Greek word. Sorceries is pharmakia in the Greek. And it's where we get the word pharmacy or pharmaceuticals from. Do you know what pharmaceuticals are? Drugs. <laughs> you know, when I was a kid, when I was a kid, they didn't say pharmacy on the stores. I remember some places that had things that said drug store. And I was wondering why are they selling drugs there? And you know, somebody had to explain to me that no, it's, it's a pharmacy. But they don't use the word drug anymore because it just it sounds bad. So they say pharmacy. Same pharmacy way. means drugs. Again, as a young person growing up, I grew up in a ghetto area and most of the guys that sold drugs identified as pharmacists. <laughs> I'm not kidding. They call themselves street pharmacists. That's just a popular term. I mean, people still do that. I'm a street pharmacist. And we laugh, but that's exactly what they are. They're, they're just, they sell drugs on the street and not in the store. They do it illegally, not legally. But I'm here to tell you, an Oxycontin and heroin aren't much different. One's manufactured synthetically. The other is not. I mean, you both have to do something to manufacture it, but one of them is, you know, heroin is extremely cheaper and more potent. But Oxycontin, a lot of men, it's, it's heroin. It's man-made heroin. It's synthetic. Fentanyl is another. Oof. That's, that's messed up. But my point is, sorceries are nothing but drugs. We don't think of it like that, right? When we play with drugs for recreation, we play with sorcery. Well, I don't consider it sorcery. You don't have to consider it anything. It's what you're doing. Now, I want to be clear. There are people who, let's say smoke weed. That's the big one, right? Excuse me. Who use THC as a means of medical use. I'm not going to knock that at all. You know, my dad has several vertebrae that are fractured. And, you know, he's had surgery. He's got nuts and bolts up and down his back and I mean he's in pain the dude's always in pain and I mean, sometimes it's unbearable for him and so the doctors he has pills and he can legally smoke marijuana and you know I'm against all of it I hate it all because I just hate pills and I hate weed because weed held me down for years but I remember one day my dad said you know because I was more against marijuana back in the day because I, I struggled with it personally I remember one day he told me, he's like, I didn't even ask him, we were just talking. He's like, yeah, man, I hate these pills, bro. He's like, I, every, he's like, when I just take pills and no weed, I'm a zombie all day long. I'm just zonked, I can do nothing. 
He says, if I take a quarter of a pill and you know, smoke some weed with it, he's like, I can function and it's tolerable. I remember, I'll never forget when he said that. After that, I was like, you know what? I'm being too far right in my view because the Bible did say in Genesis, everything God created was good. Everything God created. What, what, what was good that God created? How much of it? Everything. What is that? Is it, does it mean anything was bad? No. One thing was bad and it wasn't something he created is what he didn't create. He said, it's not good that man should be alone. That's it. It's the only thing that God said wasn't good. It wasn't something he created. It's what he didn't create. That man was alone. That means the poppy plant is good. The marijuana plant is good. That means whatever other plants, they pull drugs, so they're good. And they have a purpose. The problem isn't the drug. The problem is the abuse. The problem is, what did I write down in a row? Recreation. That's the problem. Has anybody in here ever undergone surgery? Raise your hand, anybody. You three, did you guys get put down when you did it? Or did you guys get any kind of shot of any kind? Are you happy you got those things done? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I bet you are. If they have to ever have to do surgery on me that's major, I want it done too. I had my ingrown toenail taken out once and they shot my foot full of something. I got numb in my whole foot. I'm telling you, I was so glad that I could not feel it. That was awesome because that would have been a horrible little thing than ripping out my toenail. That was horrible. I watched them do it because I don't like looking away. And I'm here to tell you, I'm glad they put whatever uh, drug they put in my toe. It was great. I mean, I didn't get high, but my foot felt excellent. I mean, when it wore off, my foot hurt. But So everything is good. We want to be careful how crazy we get. Now, I like what one of the guys, he's not here right now, said, especially when it comes to weed because that's a very hot topic right now and. New Mexico because they're legalizing it or it's legalized. I don't know. But I, lo I love what this guy said. He said, you know, you don't have to get high to get the benefit. And you don't. They can extract the THC portion so that you can have the medicine without getting high. So if there's anybody in here or online, huh? The CBD, I don't know what it's called. But I mean, that's part of it, the CBD oils. But I mean, so you don't have to get high to get the medicine. So if you have to get high to get the medicine, then you probably just like being high. At that point, you're playing with sorcery. But, sorry, I'm better finish this up. The first thing is murders, nor their sorceries or drugs, nor their immorality. Does anybody know what that word immorality is? Pornia. Porn. Porn? Porn. Pornia is a more, it's more broad than just what we call porn. We talked about this pretty in depth on Sunday morning going through 1 Corinthians. Pornia is a very general term in the Greek. And it simply covers sexual immorality. That's pornography, lust, sexual immorality, both homo and heterosexual. That covers anything that's out of the design of the marriage between the man and the woman that God created. Pornia is all, it just wraps it up and says... They don't repent of the pornea, of sexual immorality. Now, do you know why they don't repent of it? Because they like sinning. They love their sin. In John chapter 2, the end of 2, Jesus said he was not willing to trust himself to anyone because he knew what was in man. And basically man is evil. <laughs> Our hearts are corrupted. Nobody likes to give up their sin. You know why we sin? Because we like it. Now, the difference between the believers is we're given the Spirit of God and we learn to hate sin. And so as the Christian, we look at sin differently than those who don't know the Lord, those who aren't sealed and filled with the Spirit of God. They look at sin and the world just loves it. They can't get enough. They eat it up. So don't be shocked when the world acts like this. I, I'm baffled whenever Christians are, I can't believe these unbelievers. I'm like, really? I mean, I can. Like, it, What do you expect? Like, they're doing what unbelievers do. Uh, you're shocked, really? I'm not. Now, when Christians act like this, shame on us for saying nothing or for allowing it. Christians should never act like this. Not that you might not fall in any of these areas. But to practice any of these as a habitual lifestyle, I would really have to question whether or not you are in the faith.
to have no conviction, to simply live out your sin with no care in the world, no conviction. I'm not going to say you're not a child of God. I'm just going to say, do you really want to find out when you stand before God? Is that really something you're willing to gamble with? The Christian ought to be filled with conviction concerning these things. Their immorality nor their theft. Again, God is personally judging the world and people would still rather die doing it their way than repent. And I know how my heart works and most of you probably have a similar heart like mine. And deep in my little heart, I think, man, how stupid these people must be. Anybody kind of feel like that? I'm not going to lie, I thought it. But I want to ask you, how often do you or do I sin and not repent? Or it takes us forever to repent. Sometimes it takes us getting busted to repent. If any of us in here or online are doing things we shouldn't be doing, I'm going to tell you, repent. Just, you know, let it go. It's not worth getting in the way of your relationship with God. It's not worth you sacrificing your intimate moments with your Savior. Just let it go. Let it be what it is. Put it away and allow God to fill you. Let God be the one that fills your desires. Because sin looks promising, but it always leaves you empty. It always leaves you wanting more. It always leaves you hanging. It leaves you guilty, shamed, and, and empty. That's it. And so these people, they see the power of God at work. They know the scriptures. They're, they got angels flying around heaven. We've already seen some. They've got witnesses, the 144,000, and they refuse to repent. May that not be said of the believers today. May when, when we're confronted with sin, may we repent. May we be bold in our witness and our testimony so that our loved ones would never have to experience this time, you guys. This is a real thing coming, and I think it's going to be sooner than later. I do. doesn't mean it is. I could be wrong, and 50 years from now, I still might be up here teaching. But I just I don't see it. I, I really believe this is closer than many of us anticipate. So uh, You should second that. <laughs> Let us pray, you guys. Father, we thank you for being God, and we thank you for your word, and thank you for all these little nuggets you throw in there, Lord, and thank you for just allowing us to get together, to fellowship with each other, to fellowship with you, Lord. Thank you for what you are doing in our hearts. Thank you for what you're doing in Santa Fe, for what you're doing in New Mexico, in America, and across the world. You are moving, Lord. You've never stopped would you continue to open our eyes and hearts to what it is you're doing and may we jump on your train, Lord, and do it your way. May we never seek to do it our way. I thank you for those that are here this evening. I thank you for those that have watched online and are watching online. I pray that you'd bless each and every one of these, that you'd go with them for the rest of this weekend, Lord. That you'd bless them uniquely, that you'd hold them with your righteous right hand, that you'd walk with them and guide them and direct them in every way. That you'd cause your face to shine upon them, Lord. We do pray for Margaret and ask that you'd help her to feel better, Lord. We pray that you would bring in people who are gifted in music to be able to worship you. Lord, we pray that you'd bring in a team so that we can worship you with music. It's your church, God. If you don't want us to do it, we won't. We just pray that you would. We believe it's pleasing to you, God. Help me not to be discouraged, Lord. Help me to really set my heart and my eyes on you and not to look at what's going on in this fellowship or Santa Fe. Encourage my faith to know that we are here for a purpose, Lord. Just thank you for being our God, for loving us, and for dying for our sins. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. amen.